Well, I'm really glad that Colin went first <laughs> because I have a different slant on what Colin is talking about. Um, Colin is talking from the perspective of a player, a recent player, and when he's talking about concussion, he's talking about it as a traumatic brain injury. So traumatic brain injury meaning um, it ha it's an injury that happened on the field and the discussion about that is how do you diagnose, know that it happened, um, recognize that it's happening on the field, and then how do you treat it after it happens? Um, and so those are important things. We still don't have a really good handle on a lot of that. We don't have a very good handle on identifying when it happens, you know, wh unless it's the really big hit where somebody's flat out on the field. Um, it's, it's happening in every play, okay? On a, on a smaller level, um, concussion is happening on every play because concussion isn't just getting knocked out. It's not just being flat out and not being able to get up or standing up and being dizzy or having a headache. There are smaller sub-concussive events that happen and when those add up, it's a repetitive brain injury. So every hit that's happening on the field is an injury and we're not doing a very good job of figuring out when those are happening. And we're doing a terrible job of diagnosis and we're doing a terrible job of treatment. Okay? We don't really know exactly how long you have to sit out, not only from a game, but from all of your activity to be able to, to have your brain recover. There are many clinicians now who say, you have to stop all activity, television, iPhone, iPad, get, uh, video games, all activity to let your brain rest for a period of time after a brain injury like that. So we're doing a terrible job of that too. We need a lot more evidence, medical evidence on how to do a better job of treating that. And then the one thing that we've run a very, done a very bad job of is, in an epidemiologic sense, following players after they've had a career like this in understanding what happened to them after three years, four years, 10 years, 15 years of repetitive brain injury that happened while they were in practice and happened while they were on the field during a game. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, and I know Sylvia will, will also bring up her own personal experience, um, that what happened there is not, was no longer traumatic brain injury. What happens after that is called uh, it, it, it has a different name. It's a, it's a different illness than the acute traumatic brain injury that happened. It becomes a chronic disease, and it's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. So many of these players who've had these brain injuries who then begin to develop CTE start to manifest it in different ways. Typically, it starts to look like memory loss at a young age, relatively young age, mid-40s, late-40s, early-50s, memory loss, cognitive impairment, confusion about what you were doing or what you were supposed to be doing. In some, it's behavioral outbursts, not being able to control their temper or their behavior. You start to see things like that happening. And then those be begin to become so frequent, those symptoms begin to become so frequent, um, the, the mood, the memory loss, that it then gets diagnosed as chronic traumatic encephalopathy or a form of dementia. Prior to that, we've done a terrible job of diagnosing this. It's only in the last 10 years that we've begun to understand what chronic traumatic encephalopathy is. Before, it was being diagnosed as depression. You used to play in the NFL and you used to be in the limelight. You used to have all this money and all this attention and you were always at the parties. You were having a great time. And now you're out in the real world where you had to go get a real job. And now you're depressed because you're coming down off that high. There are actually papers written about that. So it, people were being misdiagnosed. They were depressed. They were having mental health disorders. They were having behavioral problems. They were being put on antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, when actually their problem was that they had chronic traumatic encephalopathy that was not being properly diagnosed. In my own case, my husband was diagnosed at the age of 56, and he was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment is an early form of dementia. He had suffered from some memory loss, he was having some cognitive problems, and he finally had a problem one day that I realized was so significant. And here I am in the health field, and I realized it was so significant that I said, oh, something's terribly wrong here. We had a big vegetable garden out in our backyard. A neighbor showed up one day with a box of strawberry plants, said to my husband, do you want them? I have extra. My husband said, great, but I've already planted my 
garden inside my fenced-in area. We lived out in the country. We had rabbits and deer to worry about. So he said, I'll just till up an area over here on the outside of the fence, and I'll put the strawberry plants in. This was in June. He put them in. Within a week, they were eaten down to the ground. We dug them up. We made a small space inside the fenced area for them, and we put these little nubs that were left in the ground. By September, they'd grown back. They were sending out shoots. My husband is standing there in September looking at the, the strawberries saying, what am I going to do with these? They're taking over. I said, well, you know, you have to make some space for them in the, in the fenced-in area. He said, I'm going to put them over there. And he pointed to the area where he had planted them and dug them up and moved them from because he had absolutely no recollection that he had ever put them there and that he had dug them up and moved them. So it was in September of that year, September of 1999, that my husband began to go through a series of tests to figure out exactly what was, what was going on. And like many diseases, dementia is one where you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a diagnosis of rule out. I can't find anything else wrong with you. All of your tests come back fine. I can't find any brain uh, scar tissue. I can't find any stroke. I can't find anything which means it's probably cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment. In 1999, he was having those problems, but they were still fairly mild. By the early 2000s, he could no longer drive. He could no longer read a book or a newspaper. By 2004, 2003 time frame, I had to hire someone to take care of him at home when I was going to work to make sure that he was eating his lunch, taking his medications, and not messing around with chainsaws and things like that. By 2007, by January of 2007, my husband was in an assisted living facility for people with dementia because he could no longer dress, bathe, or care for himself, and he was having some behavioral outbursts where I could no longer take care of him at home. That was in January of 2007. As time progressed, he reached a point by about 2010 where he could no longer even walk because his brain function had started to change in such a way that he could no longer physically move around and take care of himself the way, that, the way that a normal person can get out of a chair. He could no longer do that. And by June of 2012, he died, and he was in a very, very, he had very, very severe dementia and very, very severe physical disabilities at that time. We don't know how to diagnose CTE uh, prior to death. CTE right now can only be diagnosed on autopsy. So it's when his brain was examined that he was found to have the most severe level of CTE in combination with Alzheimer's disease. He had both. And as Dr. Ann McKee, the neuropathologist at Boston University who did the brain analysis on him, as she said, she, she said it was almost like his brain was on fire. It was like the CTE had caused this cascade of events that just had, ha had, had caused his brain to burn out. So when he died, his brain was exactly one-third the size of what it should have been for a man his age, and he was estimated to have the cognitive function of about a one-year-old. That's what the long-term effects are. That's what the long-term effects start to look like. And all the while that my husband was going through this, I became an advocate, like Sylvia Mackey, for these former players who were having these problems. And at the time, I said to players like Colin, if you want to know, or if you're married and your wife wants to know potentially what your life could look like 20 or 30 years from now, you come spend some time with me and I will introduce you to my, to your, to my husband. And I can guarantee you the conversation that you'll be having about whether or not you're going to play next year and whether or not your kid's ever going to play is going to be very different after that visit happens. And I can tell you that not one, not one player or spouse ever took me up on that offer because there were things that they just didn't want to face and just didn't want to know. So if you want to see what some of this looks like, I suggest that you look at two uh, very good documentaries that have been made. One is called Head Games, and that's about Chris Nowinski. Um, and he, it's a very good documentary that tracks the, uh, the career, the um, Harvard football and um, pro wrestling career of Chris Nowinski um, and how he had suffered from concussions and head injuries and how that um, that propelled him into being an advocate, and he is now the executive director of the Sports Legacy Institute, which is um, a not-for-profit organization that's looking at policy issues, research issues, and, uh, and, and educational issues in this area. 
Um, the a second documentary is one that's called The U.S. of Football. Um, and that's one that my husband and I were part of. And that's one where I said, you know what? If you won't come to me and take a look at what this looks like, I'm going to show you what this looks like. Because it's the only way that we can get the public, parents, players, and their spouses to completely understand the devastation that happens when repeated acute traumatic brain injury begins to turn into long-term chronic disability and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, I will also close with one other point. Um, I'm sure since I'm, I'm guessing that many of you are law students and law faculty, correct? Raise your hand. Guilty as charged. Okay. So um, I, I think you're probably all interested in what's been going on in terms of uh, the legal aspects of this. Um, there are no answers. The, it's still up in the air what's going to happen. There's no conclusion. Um, but I've been involved um, in the um, in a disability claim for my husband in the state of California and involved in the, uh, the, the claim against the NFL. Um, I personally believe that the NFL knew about what was going on, um, comparable, I guess, to the tobacco industry in knowing what was going on. Um, I believe that they, that they did cover up a lot of it and made some significant attempts to cover this up. I think a lot of, certainly a lot of what we all know now was not known 50 years ago, but I believe a lot of what we all know now was known 20 to 25 years ago. And so there could have been a lot of work done in uh, preventing some of the injury that's happened and in helping some of the former players who were suffering from this disability. And a lot of tragedies could have been prevented if the NFL had acted responsibly sooner.